who knows that we're in a battle for our souls? Not that we have lost the battle, we have won the battle, but we have to fight and occupy until Jesus comes. Amen. And you know that we've been doing a series on, on Colossians, Colossians 1, 2, and 3. Colossians 1 speaks about our upward relationship with God, where we need to have roots that go down in order for us to grow and develop our relationship towards God. In that, we die with Christ, we go down in death with Christ, and then it doesn't end there, because if it ended there, Jesus would be dead in the tomb. So what happened is God, through his power, raised raised Christ from the dead, and now we are raised with him, our spirit man is raised with him to life in Christ for us to rule and reign here on this earth in victory. The second part was that our roots needed to go downwards. Everyone knows that a good and healthy tree can only flourish when it's got good roots. And so Pastor Larry spoke on the good roots, which was developing our relationship with God and strengthening our relationship with God. Today, I get to speak about our inward man. Trust a woman to have to talk about the things that go on in your heart. And so this inward man talks about being centered in Christ and the root system within, those network, that capillary, those veins, that heart, the heart of, and the, 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 the center part of your life, the things that actually enable and empower your tree to produce its fruit. So, and then next week they talk about, uh, Pastor Larry will talk about the outward man, which the roots and the tree and the network system within develops your relationship so that you can have a relationship with others. But what I want to share with you today is our inward man, our inner man. What actually happens within us as people when we get born again? We have two people, so to speak. We have the old man, which is used to his old or her old ways and old lifestyle and old way of thinking. And then when we were born again, we went down in death with Christ, we came up as, as through the resurrection, and our spirit man was made new. This is the new believer. This is you in your new relationship with God, a new Christian. And in this state, what you have to do is you have to reprogram everything that was ever taught or um, uh, that you were ever taught or ever saw. Because now what you have to do is you have to see it through the eyes of Christ. And so we're talking about the inner man, the new humanity. The old person, when I refer to it, is the old humanity. I'm talking about our inner man in our new humanity. So, uh, 837... So at quarter past, please, will somebody give me a hand because I've got a lot of material to get through. So what I want to share with you is a story to illustrate a picture. And um, before I do that, let's open up in prayer. Father God, I just commit this message to you, this teaching to you. I thank you, Lord, that this word is burning in my heart, and I thank you that you would help me to articulate every word that you would have me speak that would make a change and a difference in your people's and your ladies' and your sons' and your daughters' lives. I I ask your Holy Spirit just to lead me and to guide me, that I'd be sensitive to what your Holy Spirit would want me to say as I speak the word, the true word of God. Amen. So I'm going to illustrate this picture. Do you remember a time, or maybe you as parents might have experienced this, you're on a walk down a path, something catches your attention, and you start going in that direction, this is your path, Do you start going in that direction and you start gaining momentum. And as you're gaining momentum, the person who you were with calls and says, hey, come back here, come back here, don't go there, you're going too fast, you're going to fall, there's a ditch. And as they say there's a ditch, you look back, you've been gaining momentum. And what happens? You fall flat on your face in the ditch. Oh my word, what humiliation. Everybody runs around you. Everybody's scurrying around you. And lo and behold, there's always that one person with a snapshot, ready to upload you to Instagram. You get up and you evaluate the damage. Your tooth is through your lip. You've got blood on your face. And you are so humiliated. That dreaded snapshot. 
the continual reminder always of your, 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 that moment, that, inev- that inevitable fall. So I've entitled my message today, The Inevitable. And so that voice that calls you back, have you ever found yourself, if we just take a picture of ourselves sometimes in, in, in a metaphorical way, that you find yourself sometimes running towards something, something has caught your attention, and now you, you veer off track from the thing that you'd set out to do, and you're running towards this, and you're going, and you're going, but somebody's calling you back and saying, no, have you thought about what you're doing? Look, you're going down a steep embankment, you're going too fast, just hold on, hold your horses, slow down. And then you fall into the ditch. You trip yourself up and you thought to yourself, I wished I had listened. I wished I had just paid attention to that voice, but it was too late. You fell into the ditch and there you were, humiliated in, your, in what you had done. Shame all over your face and you're thinking to yourself, what have I done? And there's that constant reminder in the back of your head, that constant photo, that constant snapshot of what you actually did, and it is always there to remind you. Our sin is like that. Our sin is always coming at you, pushing at you, pushing towards you, and you feel like you can never actually get the victory over this. You can never get over your anger. You're always angry, and when something triggers you, you just fly off the handle, and, you are, and it's coming towards you, and you just can't stop yourself. If you ever feel like your sin is just always coming at you, always coming at you, your issues are always coming at you and you just never seem to have the victory. And then when you succumb to it, there's that snapshot. Ding, ding, upload it to Facebook. Ding, ding, upload it to Instagram. And you never, and everybody is there to see. And everybody is there taking note, keeping on reminding you of that dreaded moment, that inevitable fall. Can anyone relate? Keep, uh, what we have to do is we've got to keep our eyes on the top shelf. Our text today is Colossians 1.17. Sorry, 1 1 through to 17. And our, our starting scripture says, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For all that we're, for all that we're, Christ, Sorry, for that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fix your thoughts on the heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life and now your true life is hidden in Christ. What are the treasures of the heavenly realm? The treasures of the heavenly realm is the fact that Jesus has given us authority, he's given us power, and he has given us the honor, and he loves us, and with him there is honor. The treasures in this heavenly realm allow us to be complete in him. One of the things, well, some of the things that we get from the heavenly realm, the treasures, the gifts that are on the top shelves, the thing that we need to be looking to is his wisdom, his wisdom for every t- situation that we find ourselves in. His love. His love that has encompasses us and has redeemed us and has set us free and doesn't see us in the sin that we used to live in, but now sees us empowered to walk away and overcome and over, uh, over, overcome that sin. His provision. He has given us provision for everything that we need. He has made available to us every spiritual gift, every good gift comes from Him. His grace, when we sin and when we fall, His grace and His His grace is upon us, His grace is towards us, and His grace is within us. So we are able in every area of our lives to overcome because when you feel weak, you can say, Father God, I am unable to do this. I thank you that your grace is within me, and because your grace is within me, I'm empowered to do what it is you need me to do. When you are feeling downhearted, downtrodden, overcome and overwrought with worry and anxiety, his grace is upon you. 
His grace is upon you. His grace is upon you and enables you and empowers you to rise up from the circumstance and the situation, to rise up from the ashes, even when you thought you wouldn't be able to do it. And then he gives you his healing power. He says, by his stripes, you are healed. I've not only healed you, but I've made you whole. I've caused you to be in excellence of soul. When you are in excellence of soul, what that means is that everything in your life in Christ is excellent because he is excellent. And when he is excellent, that power that is in him, that is in you, has has been raised from the dead and whatever is in you cannot be of darkness, has to only be of light. And what is of light is healing, wholeness, completion. And why is that? Because you are now hidden in Christ. He covers you. He comes around you. And he does not see your sin. That robe that he covered you with right of righteousness is a robe that completely conceals and it removes and eradicates your sin. So when he looks at you, you are healed, you are made whole, you are set free, you are forgiven. And when he looks at you, he says, this is my child who I, who I am well pleased with because he sees you in his light, in his glorious light. Then what's happened is we have been cut off. All ties have been cut from the, from the natural world. And we are now hidden in him. When you got born again, the spirit of God came to live inside of you and he sealed you with his Holy Spirit. When he sealed you with his Holy Spirit, he cut and he severed all ties of darkness from you. That means you do not have a spirit of a demonic spirit living inside of you because where there's a demonic spirit, the spirit of God cannot reside. But you can be oppressed from the the things that you have been involved in before. You can be oppressed by the things that have... um been, that have dominated your life with. And that's what you've got to break free from. That's what we are breaking free from, the things of the old man, the old humanity, because we are living in the new humanity. And so where that darkness used to be in your life has now been removed, and there's now a vacancy, there's now an emptiness. And he says, think on the things above And the things above are the things that need to settle in your heart, that need to replace that which was there, was once before, the things of darkness. Are you with me? In Colossians 1 verse 26, I found this very interesting. In Colossians 1 26, it says, The mystery was hidden for ages and generations, but now it is revealed to the saints. In Colossians 1, um, where is it? Colossians... Uh, 3, 3 verse 3, it says, now our life is hidden in Christ. Before it was hidden from the saints, but now Christ is hidden in our hearts through the resurrection power. Do you see the contrast? Hidden for ages through the resurrection power, Christ is now hidden in us. Our lives are hidden in him. So we stand in the center of him. He is all around. And everything we do, we do through him. In him we live and move and have our being. We function as one with him. If we keep our eyes on the things above, and this is what Paul keeps reminding us, if we keep our minds on the things above, we will not be pulled off the path that we were once on, that we ran off because we were distracted by something that um, caught our attention, some frivolous thing that caught our attention. Because your life is centered in him, you are focused in him, and you're unable to be, well, you're not unable, you're always able to be distracted, but because your focus is on him, you are not easily distracted. You always keep your eyes focused and centered. Have you seen, have you seen somebody who's in the shopping mall and is on a mission to get to a shop? Let's talk about the men when they go shopping. They don't shop in one day and look at every shop. They are on a mission. They walk straight to the store that they want. They go straight to the shelf that they need, that they know the item is on. They pick that item. They walk straight to the till. They pay at the till, and nothing distracts them. They don't spend a cent on anything else. That is how we have to be. Centered in Christ, focused. Go get what you want, get to the till, and get out of the mall, because 
for some reason they don't like shopping. <laughs> so keep your eyes focused on the things above. And this is what Paul is saying to us. Keep your eyes focused on the things above. And what I wanted to explain to you, because it helped me to see what it actually means to have my, my, my mind centered and focused on the things above. Because when you can see from this viewpoint, you maybe have a better understanding of what you actually need to focus your eyes on. And Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He took the government upon his shoulders. He dismantled the powers and the structures of the enemy by taking the keys of death away from him, being Satan, which means that death and anything related to death can no longer have a hold on us. It can no longer keep us slaves to sin and destruction. When we die outside of salvation, we go down to eternal death. But when we are born again, we go down in death with Christ, and it doesn't end there. The same power, that dunamis power, that raised Christ from the dead, lives in you and has raised you up to life again. And as born-again believers here on this earth, we live knowing that this is our freedom, that we can no longer be held captive, we can no longer be held prisoner to addictions, to compulsive behaviors, to obsessions, and to um, the ways and the thinking of this world. He has made a new covenant with us so we can no longer be threatened with the power of death because in this new covenant, which is better than the covenant of old, he exchanged everything for us. We have nothing that we can give to God. I'll get to it later. There is one thing that we can give to God, but we can give nothing to him because he has already given everything to us. There is nothing that he needs. He exchanged everything for nothing, and for nothing we got everything. When you live knowing that the blood has bought you complete freedom, you can live from the top shelf. When you met Christ, you died in your old humanity. You die to self. You die to the things that are no longer have value in the kingdom of God. Your intentional, you, need, you, can be intentional, you can be intentional about your righteousness. The old man has died. I'm repeating a few things because in the repetition of it, you have to get the understanding that we have died to Christ. And when you understand that we've died to Christ and raised to life again, and you see it in the context that we're speaking about it, you start to realize that you need to kill the old man. The, 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 the power of the, 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 the old humanity that it has on your life. And so when we went down with him in Christ, we didn't stay there. His dunamis power raised us up. And we now have been reconciled to Christ from the dead, who is, is one with the Father. Now the Holy Spirit, whom he sent to dwell with us, now lives in us to empower you to overcome and to, great, to do greater works than he did himself here on earth. And John fifteen twenty six says, the Holy Spirit who is the helper, and I will send you the divine encourager from the very presence of my Father, and he will come to you, the Spirit of truth, emanating the Father, and he will speak to you about me. And this is what he says. He says, this is how Christ sees you. Your sins are covered. Your blood, your sins are covered with the blood of Jesus. So when you were raised to life, your, your sins were washed away, you were cleared, and now you stand righteous before him. Now he looks at you and sees you covered with this robe and no longer sees you in your sin and your shortfalls that have damaged you and caused you to decay in the old humanity. This perspective should help us and allow us to start seeing how Christ, that our, how, what a Christ-centered life looks like. What does a Christ-centered life look like? What does a Christ-centered life look like? It's one of prayer. It's one of thanksgiving. It's one where we have an identity in him. Our identity in him says that in him I have all sufficiency. In him I'm able to do all things. In him I lack and need nothing. When we live a Christ-centered life, we 
um, are not defeated by our weaknesses, but we are delighted because we know that the power of Christ that is on the inside of us strengthens us and gives us the, the, the courage and the, the hope to overcome the things that we need to overcome. In 2 Corinthians 12.10, it says that, So I am not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made stronger. For my weakness becomes a portal for God's power. Your weakness becomes a portal for God's power. So that all you have to do is say, Lord, in my, in my weakness, I can't do this. What you do is you open the portal door and he says, right, are you ready for my power? Because my power can now enter in because you've recognized that you're weak and in your weakness, I will, over, I will allow my power to flow in and that power will give you the strength and the courage and the wisdom and the mercy and whatever else it is that you need to overcome. But it cannot do that until you open the portal door by saying, Lord, I'm weak. In this situation, I'm weak. I'm unable to do whatever it is that you need me to do. So help me, Father God. Help my unbelief. Help me in my weakness. Help me in my moments of frustration and whatever else it may be. A Christ-centered life is focusing our minds on him and setting our minds on his purpose for our lives. Living on a mission. Living outside of everything that you need. Living outside of everything that fulfills your life and your purpose and your plan. Taking a portion of your life and saying, I'm going to sow this into somebody else's life. I'm going to sow this into a need. I'm going to help somebody do something that is that takes some of my time. I'm going to sow my time into something else because you have a mission. Your your mission is to live a Christ-centered life and the things in a Christ-centered life are the will and the purposes of God for your life. And what are the wills and the purposes of God for your life? To help those who are sick, to help those who are downhearted, to help those who are in captivity, to, to speak the word, to minister the word, to help set the captives free. A Christ-centered life. Sometimes it's not easy to do because we're so caught up in the things that we have to do. But it says, put to death those things that are earthly in you. Put to death those things that are earthly in you. What could possibly be earthly in me, Father God? I am holy. I'm your saint. I am, I am a child of God. I, have, I worship you every day. I've got a good heart. I, I sur- I'm surrendered to you. But let somebody cross you in the traffic. (laughs) And if you had a bazooka, you would just go like this. Blow up. I was in Joburg with my family this week. And uh, we went to the women's conference at Rivers Church. And it was so amazing. It it was just a whole other level. And the Spirit of God was there. But there were so many women. And there were so many cues. And I don't like cues. I don't particularly like to stand in a queue. And so I was like, Mom, let's just get there so that we don't have to stand in the queue. Now, if anybody knows my mother, she's 10 minutes behind late. So (laughs) so I was like, come, please come. And we're driving in the car, and she's putting foot, and she's going down in the traffic. And she's like, look at this stupid car. Look at this. I was like, don't tell the car. Now, her and I are fighting in the car. Don't tell the car it's stupid. We're late. We're in a hurry. You can't shout at the person because he's in the way. He's in the right lane. No, but they must get out of this. And we, by the time we get to the event, we're so frustrated with one another. We're like, oh, I'm coming to receive you, Lord. <laughs> and I'm like, put away those things that are earthly in you. Let the things that consume your mind and captivate you and contaminate the way you think and, and override the peace of God in your heart so that you can receive. Because let me tell you something. When your peace has been sabotaged, when your peace has been permeated, your peace is your shield. Understand that the peace of God that passes all understanding is the umpire in your life. When that peace is permeated, when, you're, when you can't think when, when your mind is racing with 101 thoughts, when there's frustration and aggravation stirring up in your heart and you can't answer somebody properly because you're agitated, your peace has been contaminated. 
And when your peace has been contaminated, you can't hear the will of God for your life. When your peace has been affected, you're not in tune with the things that the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to you. So he says, keep your mind on the things above, on the top shelf. Keep your eyes averted on the top shelf so that your peace is not affected. Because when your peace is affected, you are unable to remain in harmony with the people around you. Your speech is short. Your actions are abrupt. Your body language communicates the state of mind that you're in. And, that, and God cannot do what he wants to do for you in your life. And so it's very, very important. Now I've lost my place. Very, very important for you to understand where your peace comes from. Putting to death that which is earthly in you. What is earthly? Greed, gossip, and passions of the soul. The thing that affects us in our lives more than we even care to give attention to is the way we gossip, the way we speak about people, the way we speak about things. It is an entry into your life. And when you start speaking about other people, when you start insulting the people of God, God's elect, God's house, God's children, your friends, the people in your life, your family, what you start to do is you start to chip away at the foundations of your home. Proverbs says that uh, uh, an, evil, uh, an evil person, an uh, evil woman, breaks it down, builds, wisdom builds a house, and um, he who is unwise breaks his house down with his own words. And so what we've got to realize is that when we start to speak badly about our lives and our things and the situations in our lives, we start to break down the foundations that we have started to build in our lives that would make a change in our um, Christian walk. You see, a Christ-centered life means... Sorry, sometimes we act like we're immune to sin. We think that sin is separate from us. And sin is not separate from us. Gossiping is not separate from us. Our words are not separate from us. Our words are very much a part of us because everything that comes out of our mouth comes from our heart. And whatever we have fed our heart on is a, is, is a matter of time before it will come out of our mouths. And so what the word says is you've got to mortify sin. So I looked up the word mortify, and it said to discipline sin. And I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to discipline sin. I want to kill sin. I want to get it out of my life. I want to eradicate it. I remember when I was going through a divorce, I, um, I didn't want to get divorced, but it was just how things worked out. I was still hopelessly in love with my ex-husband at that time, my ex-late husband at the time, and... Um, I didn't want to be separate from him. I wanted to still see him. But now we were divorced. And so I would stay in contact with the friends and the people who he knew so that I could still have tabs on what he was doing. I would, I would speak, I would go onto Facebook so that I could see who was doing what and what was doing where and, and how things were working because I still wanted to keep that link to what he was doing. And when we talk about mortifying sin, we have to act, we have to divorce ourselves from sin. What does divorce mean? Divorce means the walking dead. In other words, you've got to act as if that person no longer exists in your life. You have to act dead to that person in order for you to get on with your life. And now I'm not advocating divorce. Please get me, just get me here. But in order for us, sometimes we go through things in life. And when we go through things in life, we've got to take the correct measures in order for us to get to where we need to get so that we can start recovering. And one of the things that we need to do in order to start recovering is to divorce ourselves from sin. Divorce yourself from the things that affect your spirit man, that affect your emotions, your mind. The minute you think a thought, it drops into your, into your heart. When you accept the thought, it drops into your heart and it's seed, the thought, then it drops into your heart and it sits there for a while, time, and then it's just a matter of time before you start speaking what is in your heart. It's a matter of time before you start acting what is going on in your heart. And when you start acting out what is going in your heart, it's, it's too late. And what he says is you've got to discipline the very thought. 
You've got to say no to that thought. You've got to divorce yourself. Block the Facebook page. Unlike the friend. You have to take dramatic measures. You have to say, no, sorry, I don't want to go to that event because if I go to that event, I'm going to see somebody who knows somebody who knows so-and-so and somebody who is somebody that knows so-and-so is going to see you sitting at the back there and say, there's man, let me just go and tell her what happened. And you don't want that. You need, you need to divorce yourself from the very thing that contaminates you. The word says, flee from sin. 1 Thessalonians 3 says, 3 verse 4 says, keep away from it. Keep away from the very hint of sin in your life. And then the other part of your union in Christ is one that grows in faith, which means doing something that is not for yourself, something that the Word of God instructs you to do. Something that, the, that, that you know in, in the word of God that resonates with your heart. Like for some people, they just love helping children. Go help the children. Go find a purpose. Your union in Christ is when you are doing something that pleases the heart of God. And when it pleases the heart of God, you're in line and you're in union with the word and what the word is instructing you to do. Since you are rooted in him, we, not, that we, are, we are now not only identified with him in his death and resurrection. In Christ's death, we died to sin. And in his resurrection, we rose to walk in a new life. Since we are risen in Christ, we should seek these things which are above and to show the best of our ability the goal of Christ in our lives. So, having your mind set on the things above is like... A submarine with a periscope. For everyone in the submarine to be safe and to, to be steady under the water, the periscope has to come up and it looks around to see what is actually happening around. It is reliant on the things above the water for its well-being under the water. And it's the same with our Christian walk. We need to be reliant on the things above so that our well-being can be peaceable, steady, and stable and can continue with the mission that we've been placed on. So it is very important in our walk with Christ to know what the things above are. And a Christ-centered life is one of thankfulness. Now, I was very interested to find out that in, when we were studying in Colossians 1, Colossians 2, Colossians 3 when I was studying it, and Colossians 4, it mentions and it's very clear about thankfulness. A Christ-centered life is one of thankfulness. And every time it speaks about thankfulness, it talks about being thankful in prayer. It talks about being thankful and grateful for the things that God is doing in your life. Admonishing each other with songs and hymns of praise. So it's very, very important in our new humanity to understand that thankfulness and gratefulness for what Christ has done is very important. And what has Christ done? This is what he's done. He's transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That means you're not walking in the dark anymore. You know exactly what you need to be doing, where you need to be going. And if you forget what that means, go to the word of God and say, Lord, show me what it is that you would have me do. Because this is where the light is. This is where the light is. And that is the things that build us up in the new humanity. In the old humanity, it talks about that we, this is how we once behaved, that we were characterized by our evil deeds. But now, in the new humanity, it's time to eliminate the things that used to contaminate our lives. And what are these things? Anger, fits of rage, all forms of hatred, cursing, filthy speak, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. And this is why we yearn for the things above. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all these treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion 
with Christ has severed the tie to this life and now your true identity is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself has been seen for who he really is, who you really are will be revealed and um, will be revealed for you are now one with him in his glory. So as you spend more time with God, as you spend more time in his presence, as you pursue and seek him, if it's five minutes a day and you do it for a week, you'll see by the next two we- within the next two weeks, you'll be able to spend 10 minutes with him. And then when you spend 10 minutes with him, you'll be able to spend a little bit more time with him. And when you spend those 10 or few minutes with him, initially you'll start to notice that throughout the day you start thinking about what you spend time thinking upon in the morning. And that is where you grow in your Christian walk. And what starts happening is Christ starts being revealed to you. The things of God start to become illuminated in your heart. And as the things of God start to become illuminated in your heart, you go from one level of strength to another level of strength, to one level of glory, to the next level of glory, as Christ reveals himself in you. Well, you cannot do that if you don't spend time in his presence. Practicing the presence of God. Practicing the presence of God. And the more you practice the presence of God, you will notice that your desire to do the things that were in the old man start to diminish as you desire to do things that feed the new humanity. The one thing that we can give God is our desire. The one thing that, that pleases God is to desire him. There's nothing else. Everything else that we offer up to God is like filthy rags because we don't have anything that we can give to God. But the thing that moves him is the thing that says, Lord, I want more of you. Press into him. Ask him to reveal his word to you. Pursue him. Pursue him. He says, pursue me. But we need to die to 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 um, the sin in our lives. And Paul's black catalog, I call it the black catalog, speaks about live as one who has died to every form of sin, and he lists them. Sexual sin, perversion, passion, lust, greed, which is the same thing as worshiping wealth. In another translation, it says live as one who has died to diseases and desires for forbidden for desires for forbidden things, including the desire for wealth, which is the essence of idol worship. These things kindle the anger of God against us. And I get to speak about sexual perversion and the speech of the the sins of our speech. And these particularly are the two strongholds that deconstruct the church break up the unity and affect the, and, and, and frustrate the purposes of God in our lives. He speaks of sexual sin and he says, lust, evil desire and deed. Get rid of it. Speech. How does he put sexual sin and speech together? They're so, they're so different. But if you think about it, a filthy mouth, a filthy mouth and, and, and words of destruction and perversion actually incite things that relate to sexual sin and perversion. There's a very close relationship between the filthy mouth and sexual perversion. Paul is speaking to the Colossians who are given to satisfying their wills, their flesh, and their emotions. And he talks about, when he talks about sexual sins in in these two categories, he says that when you are involved in sexual sin or when you succumb to sexual sin, he says, what you are actually doing is you are communicating to me that I am not a person, that I am just an object of lust or somebody else is an object of lust or you are an object of lust. And he says, that is not part of the new humanity. He says, we can't be thinking like that. Paul is saying there is no place for that in the new humanity because what we are doing is we are creating death. We are creating death. We are allowing it to incubate in our hearts. We're thinking about it. And as we're thinking about it, what happens is it's a matter of time before it becomes a reality in our lives. What we are feeding our spirit man is the very thing that we are going to do and start acting out on. What we watch is going to be the very thing that contaminates our thinking. 
Sometimes you can't desire something if you haven't thought about it. If you haven't thought about it and until you see it, maybe you will only start thinking about it. And then it takes root in your, in your heart and your life. You see, you can't desire anything that you don't know about. Unless you know about it, can you start thinking and desiring it? And when you start communicating this um, and, and start functioning in the sexual sin, what starts happening is you start to communicate to other people that I am, you are not like me. And I am not like you. There's a distinction between us. And there is no distinction between us. We are one in Christ. We are pure. We are made holy. We are sanctified. We are set apart. So when we, we in, invite sexual sin into our lives, what we start to do is we start to contaminate the way we think. And we have to dethrone all of those things. They take precedence and priority in our lives in order for us to walk in victory, in order for us to be confident in our new humanity. And that's the problem with us as believers. We're not confident in our new humanity because we are keeping our sin as pets in the backyard. And when people come over, what starts to happen is you put the pet in the backyard and so the house is nice and clean and everything's great and you're a nice person and you don't do this and you don't do that. But the minute the people leave and you're alone and you've got nothing to do and you're bored, you open up the back door and you let the pet in. Because why? Because we actually like our pets. We actually like our sin because our sin comforts us when we're alone. You know? When I was a hairdresser, one of the things that I remember somebody phoning, people phoning and saying, We've got lice. Can I please bring my children into the shop so that you can get rid of the lice? And I would have to say to them, no, sorry, I cannot actually keep, um, the, I cannot actually have you in my shop because lice jumps, jumps from head to head. It jumps into the, 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 the poultry. It jumps into everything. So this is what you need to do. You need to go to the, the pharmacy. You need to buy this horrible, stinky, smelly shampoo with a steel comb. In the old days, we used to use a steel comb. Do they still use a steel comb? Or a very thin, fine-tooth comb. And you have to sit with the child or the person who's got lice, and you have to comb from the bottom. And you have to get rid of every single knit. You've got to wash behind the ears. You've got to burn the, the blankets. You've got to burn the sheets. You've got to throw away and discard of all the accessories because that lust gets into everything. And it's exactly the same with sin in our life. It contaminates everything. It contaminates everyone around you. It contaminates everything. So you've got to get rid of it. And there's only one way that you can get rid of it. You can, you can manage your sin. You can go to a rehab. You can go to an institution. You can go to a place that will help you with sin. But the only thing that can draw, destroy the power of sin in your life is the power of Christ. And you cannot do it unless you are born again. There have been, there's been proof of people who've been able to override their addictions and overcome their, their obsessive compulsive behaviors and their psychological disorders They're through medication and whatever. But to break the power of it, you can only do it by being born again. And then the other part is we talk, we're talking about um, premarital sex. Premarital sex is, is, a, is, a, is one of the things that destroys the church because what premarital sex is saying is that... <sighs> Let me just get it. Your sexual perversion or sexual immorality is a Greek word for pornia, which is sex outside of God's blessing. In other words, sex outside of marriage. And another form of sexual immorality is, knowing, is known as dating disorder. So we used to call it premarital sex, and our parents used to tell us that you're fornicating. Well, over here in today's time, for the millennials, it's dating disorder. And what dating disorder actually is, is saying to somebody, I, want, I am taking from you whatever you have to give, but I'm not ready to give everything yet. And so what happens is you enter into something that you are not ready to, yet to commit all of yourself to, and then you think that your, this 
this relationship is progressing well and that the good sex is an is a, is a indication of what a wonderful relationship and where this is going. But actually what you're doing is you're short-circuiting and circumventing the fact that you haven't even gone through all the stages of your personality and of your relationship and you are taking something before it's a lot of time, before it's due time for yourself when you are not ready yourself to give everything that you've got to give. So you're actually stealing from the person. You're robbing the person and yourself of what God has got in store for you. And that is what is dating disorder. God ordained marriage. God ordained sex. And God, Hollywood wasn't the one who created sex. Hollywood put, put it on the shelf for sale. And Hollywood said, yeah it's, yeah, it's here for you to take whenever you want. But God says, no, in it's a lot of time, in it's due time, when you are ready to give all of yourself, then you can have this gift. And then when the other person is ready to give all of themselves, and you're ready to give all of yourself, you come together and you consummate what God has given you in its due time. That is called um, dating disorder. You see, what happens with sin is that it has to go its full course. And James 1.17 says sin has to be, um, it has to, sin gets, but let me read it. Fully grown sin brings forth death. And when it has gone its full course, accepting a thought which takes root, meaning it has dropped into your heart, and that it stirs up desire within you, bringing you to action. And the final act is sin. And then it's just a matter of time before it produces death. I want to share with you a few things that keep us in a place of, of sin. And sin doesn't always mean that we are committing murder. But it says, do not murder. In the, in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, do not commit murder. He says, do not have, have, keep murder in your hearts. And do not cause murder in somebody else's heart. You see, we walk around assassinating people with our tongues. And this is sins of, the spe sins of speech. This is the second category of sin, where we, where we murder and assassinate people with our words. We destroy them with the things that we say, and we leave murder in their hearts. We leave murder in their hearts. And the reason why we can't get past all of these things is because we've got three things that contaminate and affect our thinking. Three unhelpful things that cause the unbelief in our hearts. And unbelief can be present where there's faith. Unbelief just means that you're not, you, you have some different ways of thinking. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. It means that you just need to have your thinking rectified. You need to set your mind on the things above. And so one of the things that, that um, of, of unhelpful thinking, which is the voice of unbelief in our hearts, is that it's pointless. It's pointless to try and overcome sin. No one's doing it. It's too hard. I've tried everything and I just can't get the victory over it. The second thing that, that the second voice in our head says it's just impossible. No one else is doing it. Why should I do it? It'll be okay. I can just live with this for a little bit longer. And then the third voice of unbelief in our hearts is the fact that it might just be too risky. It means that we might just give up more than we, than we desire to. It means it might just cost us something that we're not prepared to give. And in the new humanity, Jesus says, I want you to keep your eyes on the things above. I want you to get rid of these things that are not beneficial for you. I want you to keep your peace I want you not to allow your peace to, to be centered in the peace of God. Let it be your shield. Let it come around you. Let it protect you. Let it keep you. Let it umpire your heart. And then let the peaceable fruits of the Holy Spirit, which is patience, which is kindness, which is long-suffering, which is humility, humility, let it rule in your heart. As you replace the old humanity with the things of the new humanity, you, don't, you lose interest in the things that, that frustrate your purposes and the purposes of God in your life as you desire more of the things on the top shelf. You see, 
past behavior sometimes in, 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 bio, in, in bio marketing, they talk about past behavior as future performance and that the same thing, you will do the same thing every time. When you walk into a shop, you go to the same aisle, you pick up the same product and it's the same with sin. When you have a choice, you will always go and pick up the same thing. But the word of God says that that's not true. You can break the power of that sin in your life through the Holy Spirit through being born again, through the resurrection, through the dunamis power of Christ. The power that raised Christ from the dead can break the power of that sin in your life, the power of that addiction over your life. Yes, we need rehabilitation centers. Yes, we need institutions. Yes, we need medication. But more than that, we need to have a desire in our heart to focus on the things of God and not focus on how much we fail, but focus on how much we want to do the things of God. You see, when we focus on saying no to ourselves the whole time, we deprive ourselves. But when we focus on saying, Lord, I want more of you. Yes, Lord, I can do that. Yes, it's a small one, but I can accomplish it through the grace and the power of your Holy Spirit. So stop focusing on that which you can't do. And focus on that, who, on him who has given you the strength, the strength and the courage and the power to do what you can do. And the only way that you can do that is by embarking on a relationship with him. And as we just close our eyes for a minute, I just want to take a minute and ask you to just consider what it is in your old humanity that you want to lay aside. What is it that you're trying to eradicate from your life that you seem to have no control over? And just say, Father God, I, was, I went down in death with you. And with Christ, I was raised to life again. Through the dunamis power, the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. And I ask you to do a miracle in my heart right now. I cast out that which is not of you. I cast out that darkness that's contaminated my heart, that's fragmented my heart, that's broken the things inside of me, that's occupied space. I ask you, I send it out, I cast it out in the name of Jesus. And now where there's this vacancy in my heart and in my life, I ask you, Heavenly Father, to do a miracle in my heart. I ask you to heal my heart, heal my soul, cause me to be in excellence of soul today as I just surrender to you. I thank you for the Spirit of God that is healing and restoring right now that is bringing wholeness, that is removing old mindsets, that is taking charge of the things of God and causing a desire for the things of God in our lives. In Jesus' precious name. And if there's anybody here, as you keep your eyes closed, who hasn't committed their hearts to God, to Jesus, and made Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and would like to, who would like to get the power of God in their lives regarding the, the things that they face, to break the power of darkness over their lives, and you would like a relationship with Christ right now because you don't have one, please raise your hands. Please just raise your hands. I thank you for each and every person here, Father God, who is born again, who is set free, who is healed, and who is delivered. Father God, your word is alive in our hearts, and I just give you praise. I give you thanks, and I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.